song, Thou Art Worthy. It'll be on the board. And uh, for those who are uh, on Facebook or YouTube, so glad you're joining us. I uh, wish you'll be, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Have a seat. 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 I am so sorry. I, I am so sorry. Remember when I went to Ecuador. Anyway, yes, if you're welcome on Facebook, we're welcoming Facebook and all that stuff. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Those who are visiting with us, thank you for being here. You remember y'all sent me to Ecuador back in May. And when I went to Ecuador, I preached at a church called Bethany Baptist Church in La Union, Ecuador. And there was about 150 or 125 people in this outside church. It's a really, really nice little building. And I noticed that a lot of them didn't have Bibles. So in my sermon, I asked, if we got you Bibles, would you read them? And would you, would you, you know, because Bibles are not, I didn't know how much they were. And so I just committed a hundred Bibles. And you know why I did that? Because I knew my church would get my back. I knew if I ever gave my church a, a challenge that would help the kingdom of God, they would back up their nutty pastor. Well, we raised, we, so we came up with the, like a figure of like $580 for 100 Bibles, okay? $3 for regular Bibles and $11 for large print Bibles. And so we bought, so we raised $500 and, or $660, $62. Uh, with that, they bought 120 Bibles or something like that. And this is a video of the Bibles being given to the people in Ecuador. And the very first person you're going to meet is man and his wife. Y'all bought him a MacArthur study Bible because during graduation service they had this little tent and had money left over that you gave me, that you gave me. And so I bought this pastor a MacArthur Spanish study Bible. And so uh, anyway, so here we go. All right. Oh, man, sound? Ah, oh, there we go. Turn it up. Crank it up. <laughs> Hi, Pastor Daniel and the church. Pastor Daniel, do you remember these people here? So this is Pastor Yasmin and his wife, Tatiana. Um, I was talking to Pastor Yasmin yesterday and he was asking me, oh, by the way, do you have some Bibles? And I was like, yes, I do. So these are some of the Bibles that uh, we're giving to them uh, for ministry that they're doing in a location called Mokache Seis. So do you guys, ustedes quieren decir algo? Gracias, amado Pastor Daniel y a la iglesia que están apoyando este ministerio y esta Biblia será de gran Otra vez, otra vez. Ah, excelente. Y en el mensaje, él preguntó a algunas hermanas los que no tenían Biblia. Entonces, algunas hermanas y hermanos alzaron las manos. Entonces, ya que. La Biblia el pastor ya la envió. Entonces, tengan la bondad de ponerse de pie las hermanas que esa vez se usaron las manos.
Thank you for sending me. Thank you for giving. You never know whose lives you're going to touch for time and eternity by sending those Bibles. And what if it's just one? And that one reaches one. And then that one reaches one. And that one reaches one. It's our responsibility to spread the gospel. It's God's responsibility to do something with it. Amen? Amen. So, um, yeah, if that didn't touch your heart, man. You're, you need to come talk to me after church because uh, you may want to get saved. Uh, man, that was awesome. And who gets the glory? God. God. To God be the glory because he is worthy. And we're going to do this twice. I didn't even get to talk to you yet. So this is going to be real interesting. But we're going to do He is Worthy twice, okay? Let's all stand and sing, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord. I think some of y'all may know it, but you know it the second time through. another quartet. Awesome. I love it. All right, John, I've I've already put the next verse up, so let's sing it again. You know it now. Let's sing out. Thou art the object of our faith. He is the object of our affections, but not because we loved him, but because he loved us, what church? First. Praise God. Get your hymnals out. Turn to page 211. I love thee. I love thee, O Lord. Now remember, it's, it's, a, it's a rest against Michelle. 211. I got a feeling you're already there. Oh man. All right. Uh, aren't y'all glad for the guys playing the, and the girls and the people playing? Isn't that great? Oh, man, so wonderful. Can you imagine them trying to follow me, though? I don't read music, and I, I can only imagine Michelle being so good as she is that she goes, man, that guy doesn't know the beats. Anyway, so we're grateful that you don't say anything on Facebook. Man, you ought to see my job at church. I have to follow this guy. All right, let's, let's sing out, church. I love thee.
sound good, Michelle? Did you? They all sound great. Y'all sound like you actually believe this stuff. That's awesome. Well, the next song is on the board, and it's Shout to the Lord. You know it? Yes. And so uh, let's, let's shout. You can't sing this song whispering, can't you? Shout to the Lord all the year. No, you can't sing it that way. You have to shout. So let's shout. <laughs> Is that the desires of your heart? Well, I pray that it is. And if it's not, I pray that today it will be your desire. That during the sermon that you'll wake up to the gospel. That, that God will become real to you today. That's my prayer. And that's the prayers of the people here. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we take up our tithes and our offerings. Our sovereign Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for all that you've done for us. And because of your great love towards us, it makes us want to sing. You give us a song in our heart. The world beats us down with all its negativity and all its bad news, with all the sin and, and, and things that sin does that brings chaos and hurt and damage and, and damnation to folks. Lord, we're glad that we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. So, God, thank you for that. Lord, thank you for showing grace in our lives. Thank you, God, for allowing us to experience your grace, your unmerited favor, nothing that was in us and about us that would, that would want you to save us. But, God, you did. So, God, thank you for that. Lord, so now, so now Lord, as we give back to you that which you've given to us, we do that not out of, out of compulsion, but out of a deep love and devotion to you. 
It's yours, God. Everything we have is yours. So we're giving back to you that which you've given to us. As we worship you, bless the gift and the giver. May you use every penny to further your kingdom, to your honor and to your glory. And the church said, Closer walk with thee. You didn't stump me on that one, Michelle. You, the only thing that stumped me was how you were playing it. I don't know how you can do such, how you can do that. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Aren't you glad Michelle plays at our church? Amen. Aren't you glad Bob plays the trumpet in our church? And Rich, I know you're watching. We're glad that when you don't have COVID that you come to our church. So anyway, all right. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. You're going, wait a minute, we're three weeks into Romans? We're not out of verse 1 yet? Nope. In fact, I could have came up with three other sermons out of that. We could have talked about, uh, really, we could have talked about what it is to be a servant. That's one sermon. We could talk what it is to be called. That could be another one. We could talk about what it means to be a past, an apostle. That's another one. We can talk about what sets apart mean. And now we're going to talk about, but we are going to talk about the gospel of God. And so there's so much into Romans that we could really spend a lot, and we are going to spend a long time. It's 16 chapters, and we're going to study it. And so how important is Romans? Well, Tim Chalice, and if you don't know who Tim Chalice is, you ought to. His last name is C-H-A-L-L-I-E-S. And uh, if you are a Facebook friends with me, if you're not, friend me on Facebook or friend Expressway Baptist Church on Facebook because usually when I post something, I tag Expressway. And uh, I get a lot of stuff from Tim Chalice. Uh, he has a little blog, and he has blogs within the blogs and some great great reading. Not everything that you want to read every single time, because that interest may not be you at the time, but there's always something, and he posts something Monday through Saturday, and uh, it's wonderful. But Tim Chalice said this, it's only a slight exaggeration to say that if you understand Paul's letters to the Romans, you understand the Bible. Isn't that great? Wouldn't y'all like to understand the Bible? Man, I do. So Tim Chalice says that if you understand Romans, you'll probably understand the Bible. And one of the reasons why, because the Bible, Romans includes a lot of Old Testament in it. And so we need to read more of the Old Testament. 
Continues, says. He says, otherwise, said otherwise, the person with no knowledge of the rich truth of Romans will necessarily have a weak understanding of the Christian faith. Conversely, the person with extensive knowledge of it will have a much enhanced understanding of the Christian faith. It truly has that central a place in the Scriptures. So why is it important to understand the book of Romans? We are studying the book of Romans because we want to know God. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, last week, we talked about what that meant. First of all, we saw that Paul was a sinner. Can anybody tell me, anybody that's 20 years old and younger, how much money I got today? I got $5. Can anybody tell me, 20 years and younger, what was Paul's name before he changed it to Paul. What was Paul's name? I said it last week. No, Larry, you're over 20. Five dollars right here. Oh, y'all looking at Kate? Who told you? Who told you? Did somebody tell you? Okay, I'll a- and I'll ask Alexis. What's? It was Saul. Come get it. There you go. Here's your twenty dollars. Hey, you remember that twenty dollars you owe me? I mean, five dollars. Oh, it's five. Right. Never mind. Ah. And that's why I don't carry a lot of money with me. <laughs> Did you really know that? Okay. Good. All right. So yeah. So he was a sinner, and he was named Saul. But then God changed his life, and that's what happens to us when we change. When God changes our life, when we're sinners, and then we become saints. When we get saved, God changes our lives. And when God changed my life, I didn't change my name from Joseph Daniel McCroskey to something else. I kept my name, but he changed my direction. And that's what, God, that's what salvation is. We used to call it conversion a long time ago. The Bible calls it a regeneration, a new birth. Jesus says in John chapter 3, unless you be born again, you cannot enter to the kingdom of God. You must be born again. My birthday is July 15th. Y'all can write that down. My birthday is July 15th. That's my beginning, well, my beginning point in all what was at conception, whatever, nine months before July 15th, 1960 was. But I was born on that day. And so I celebrate my birthday on that day. But I had to be born again. And I remember October of 1971, sitting in a pew by myself, because my family didn't go to church, sitting in a pew, and Pastor Travis Case of Tabernacle Baptist Church in West Memphis, Arkansas, preached a sermon on heaven and hell. And as the old preachers would say, he preached hell hot and heaven sweet. Now, I knew who Jesus was, but I was still lost. I knew that he died and rose again three days later, but I was still lost. I knew that Jesus was God, but I was still lost. It wasn't until that day, on that moment, at that time, that God, with the Holy Spirit, changed my life, and I gave my life to Christ. I was born again. Has that happened to you? Have you been born again? Billy Graham would be able, if he was still with us, if Billy Graham was here, one thing, we'd have a lot more people. (laughs) But if Billy Graham was here, he could tell you, he could show you the exact spot in North Carolina where he got saved. His wife, Ruth, can't give you within a five-year period when she was saved. She just knows that she was saved. 
So just because I know exactly the day and the time and all that stuff that, I'm, that I was born again, I remember that. Listen, you may not. I don't, Kathy, you can't, can you? But she knows she's saved. How does she know she's saved? Because she has a new attitude. She has a new direction. She has a new heart. She has a new desire. See, when you're saved, your affections change, the Bible says. You have an affection towards Christ. As you know, I love ice cream. As you can clearly see, I love ice cream. Thank you for not laughing or saying amen. I'm going to start working on that. If you put chocolate ice cream right here, and if you put vanilla ice cream right here, I have affections for both of them. I like them both. But if you said, Daniel, choose one, I'm going to the chocolate every single time. Because that's my affections towards that. The Bible says before we become a Christian, our affections are not towards God at all. A lost person doesn't think about God, doesn't care about God, doesn't want anything to do with God. He has no bearing on his life. But when you're born again, your affections change. You do care about God. You do want to know what God is. You do want to follow his path. And there's some people here maybe today or watching on Facebook or watching on YouTube or wherever you're watching it. You may be watching it on August 21st, 2022, or you may be watching it someday this week or whenever. And you go, well, I really don't have affections towards God, but I, I kind of want to. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit working on your life saying, you know what? You're lost, but you, you need to be saved. And so that happened to Paul. Paul, he was Saul. And then God knocked him off his horse and at the road of Damascus. And God saved him. God changed his heart. God changed his affections. Instead of hating God, he started loving God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might. And you know what happened to him after that? It happens to him what happens to everyone else. Number two, not only was he a ser- sinner, but he was a servant of Jesus Christ. He was a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant is the word doulios, which we get the word deacon from. It means we're servants. When God saved, are you listening to me, church? Listen, when God saved you, you became his slave. I know we're not allowed to talk about stuff like that in today's society, but it's just the truth. We are his servant. We are his slaves. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. In fact, the word Lord means king. He's our king. We are the ones we follow him. When you call yourself a Christian, you say, I'm a Christ follower. I follow his precepts. I follow his desires. I, I, in fact, Jesus says, to save your life, you must what? Lose it. God, it's not my will anymore. It's what? Your will. And Paul, God called Paul to be an apostle. That's number three. Not only was a servant, but he was surrendered. He was called to be an apostle. What are you called to do? I don't know. But this I do know. God called you to serve him somewhere. Now, I wonder if there's an organization that God has created where we could, when we're saved, that we could use our spiritual gifts and our, all these other talents that we have to reach the kingdom of God. It, did, did God ordain an institution like that? And what's it called? Oh, that come on, church, say it. It is the church. The church is important. It should be primary in your life. Calvin said, you can't call God your father if you don't call the church your mother. We as Christians, we're saved. We become servants. We become surrendered. And we become, as Paul is, set apart. We're set apart. What are we set apart from? We're separate for the gospel of God. We're set apart for the gospel of God. And today, I want to talk about the gospel of God. Australian theologian. E. Stanley Jones says this, Religion, our man's search for God. That's what religion is. The gospel of God is 
The gospel is God's search for man. There are many religions, but there's one gospel. There's a lot of people that talk about the gospel, and I don't think they understand what the word gospel means. So for the next however many minutes it is, we're going to talk about what is the gospel. We need to get this right, because quite honestly, the eternal souls of people are at stake if we don't understand what the word gospel means. If I had to select one scripture to give me a definition of the gospel, it would be 1 Timothy 1.15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the most foremost, or for whom I am the foremost. So what's the gospel? Well, the word gospel literally means good news. It means good news. It means a well message, a good message. So what's this good message that we have? Well, I love, as you can imagine, what R.C. Sproul says. So it's rather long, but I want to read it to you. This is what R.C. Sproul says is the essence of the gospel. Quote, there's no greater message to be heard than which we call the gospel. But as important as it is, it is often given a massive distortion or oversimplification. People think that they're preaching the gospel to you when they tell you, quote, you can have a purpose in your life or that you can have meaning in your life or that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. All those things are true, and they're all important, but they don't get to the heart of the gospel. Did you hear that? Here it is. R.C. Sproul. The gospel is called good news because it, because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings. Did you know you had a problem as a human being? You do. We all do. And it's simply this, that God is holy, and he is just, and I am not. And at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before a just and holy God, and I will be judged. That's the truth, isn't it? The Bible says in the point in a man wants to die, and then what? The judgment. We all are going to stand judgment, not before Pastor Daniel. And believe me, you want to be in judgment before Pastor Daniel because I'm a sinner just like you. But we're not. And you can give me every reason in the world why you can't come to church. You can give me every reason in the world why you can't do this or that and the other. And I, because I have a sympathetic heart, I will understand. I'll get frustrated, but I will understand. Because I'm a sinner just like you. But God is not a sinner. God is holy and God is just. And at the end of our lives, we are going to stand before a just and holy God and we will be judged. See, you can't have good news until you understand the bad news. And this is the bad news. And I will be judged either on the base of my own righteousness or lack of it or the righteousness of another. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus lived a perfect life of righteousness, of perfect obedience to God, not for his own well-being, but for his people. He has done for me what I could not possibly do for myself, but only as he lived that life of perfect obedience, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to satisfy the justice and righteousness of God. So what's the good news? The bad news is this, that we are sinners before a holy God. And because we're sinners before a holy God, we're going to face his wrath and judgment. You go, well, that doesn't sound cool. It gets worse than that when we start studying Romans 1 and 16, 17, 18 and all that stuff. But understand, you can't, you can't be saved. In fact, our Sproul says this. You talk about being saved? 
Being saved from what? What are we being saved from? Here's the answer. And it may be another $5 question next week. What's the answer? What are we saved from? We're saved from God's wrath. Did you get that clear? You're disqualified. Did y'all get that? What are we saved from? God's wrath. We're saved from God's wrath. See, that's what makes the cross so scandalous. Because at the cross, God's justice and wrath for sin and sinners is met with God's love for sinners. See, Christ did that which we could not do. I'm going to continue reading R.C. Sproul. The great misconception in our day is this, that God isn't concerned to protect his own integrity. He's kind of wishy-washy deity who just waves a wand over forgiveness for everyone. No, for God to forgive you is a very costly matter. It costs the sacrifice of his own son. So valuable was that sacrifice that God pronounced it valuable by raising him from the dead so that Christ died for us. He was raised for our justification. So the gospel is something objective. It is a message of who Jesus is and what he did. And it also has a subjective dimension. How are the benefits of Jesus subjectively appropriated to us? How do I get it? The Bible makes clear that we are justified not by our own works, not by our own efforts, not by our own deeds, but by faith and by faith alone. It's not just understanding cognitively, but it's trusting God for everything. It's by faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. So who, do you, who are you trusting in your salvation? Well, I'm trusting Christ. Well, how do you know? Are you really trusting in Christ? Has that fact changed your life? The Bible makes it clear that we're justified not by our own works, but not, not, not by our own efforts, not by our own deeds, but by faith and faith alone. The only way you can receive the benefit of Christ's life and death is by putting your trust in Him and in Him alone. You do that, you declare just by God, you're adopted into His family, you're forgiven for all your sins, and you have begun your pilgrimage for eternity. That's a pretty good definition of the gospel, isn't it? And once we receive God's grace, because we see how great a sinner we are, we fall in love with God. Now, I'm going to use Claire for just a moment. I mean, how much does Claire love her pastor right now? He gave me $5. That was just five bucks. And she, she's going to talk about it. Man, my, I, I made $5 going to church. <laughs> I got a wonderful pastor. He gave me $5. He's the best pastor in the history of pastors. <laughs> right, Claire? <laughs> What's she going to say no to me now? <laughs> Listen, if you really understand how much of a sinner you are, you'll really appreciate how much of a Savior you have. Right? So what's the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Christ died for sinners, of which I am chief. It's the good news that God delivers us from the bad news of our sins. Are you trusting in Christ? Do you recognize that you're a sinner, and because of your sins, you deserve God's wrath? And that if you were to die today, that you would spend eternity in hell because of your sin, because of your sin. Well, here's the good news for lawbreakers. You could give your life to Christ right here, right now. The Bible says, if anyone will deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me, he will be my disciple. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, God, your Lord, 
I've been living my life my own way. God, I've been messing it up. I confess that you're God. You're God, and because you're God, you're not just a regular man. Because you're God, I want to follow you and follow your precepts, and I give my life to you, Christ. I, want, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. If you confess with me, not the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9, and 10. Have you done that? Have you come to a point in time in your life you realize that you're lost? What happens when you understand the gospel? Well, what happens to you will, is what happened to Paul. The gospel moved the apostle Paul every time he spoke of it. It was not law, and neither is, it, is the gospel merely a list of moral commands. It's not simply an announcement that God has, will forgive sin. The gospel is not an appeal to do something or teaching on how to live better. The gospel is a proclamation of what God has done and what he continues to do in the life of people. Some emphasize the father's work alone in the gospel and ignore the work of the son. Others focus on what Christ on the cross did, nearly uh, posturizing his work of redemption against the Father's will. Some still solely works on the work of the Holy Spirit. God, Paul calls the gospel the gospel of God. That is to say the whole trinity is at work. From God the Father electing, from God the Son dying on the cross and raising again the third day, from God the Holy Spirit who does a work of change in a person's life. The good news is the proclamation of what the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit has done, will do, and will continue to do in your life. This is why the epistle has such an effect on us. It is from God, it is through God, and it is to God. God chose the author before he was born. That's what Paul said. In Galatians 1.15, that God chose me to be an apostle, be a messenger of God. God purchased his freedom from the death by the death of his son. God called him to be an apostle. And then God gave him a gospel, the gospel of God himself. So God is at the bottom, God is at the top, and God is in the middle of the gospel. Clearly this. What is the gospel? It's about God. And since we are dedicated as a church to spreading a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all people, it is, I believe, time to meet God in the book of Romans. I believe God has chosen us, called us, and set us apart for this very thing. Pray with me, church. Are you still with me? Pray with me, church, that his word would run and triumph in the salvation of many and the building up of his church to the glory of his name. What is the gospel? Well, first of all, number one, the source of the gospel is God. The source of the gospel is God. The phrase of God is in the genitive form. And what that means is, is that there's two nouns, there's two nouns in this phrase. And one noun is identifying the other noun. Gospel is a noun, and God is a noun. So it's a gospel of God. That means the gospel comes from God. We can trust that. Now, one of the things I was going to do in today's church, and but we were so uh, rushed for time to get to, get to everything, was I was going to make an announcement, and it's a very real announcement. I was going to ask the church, does anybody have a chainsaw that Pastor Daniel can borrow? Now, a lot of y'all are thinking, yeah, I have one, Pastor Daniel, but I actually love you, and we, we don't want you to run it. In fact, there's lots of things we'd like for you to do, Pastor Daniel, but running a chainsaw would not be one of them. Now, what's going to really hurt my feelings, somebody goes, oh, no, here we go, Pastor, have a, have a chainsaw, go at it. Because y'all know, sometimes, me and tools don't get along. But I really do need a chainsaw, because i got to cut some tree stuff up. 
<laughs> so I get a chainsaw, and I don't know how to work it. So I get this chainsaw. So I read the instructions. I do what every man doesn't do. I get the instructions. Well, the company that made the chainsaw knows how the chainsaw should work. And so I read the instructions. I trust the chainsaw manufacturer to give me the instructions to read. And if I read it, it should work. Now, which end do I hold? I'm not really sure. But I'm sure it wouldn't take me long to find out. My point is this, church. The gospel is from God. It's true and truth. You may not agree with it, but it doesn't make it tr- any less true. It's from God. Well, I don't understand it all, Pastor Daniel. Well, I don't either, and I'm unbelievably brilliant. Now, see, why do y'all keep laughing at that? Listen, church, I don't understand everything, and I don't know, I'm not really sure I want to serve a God that I understand everything. But we can trust Him. Has anybody ever lied to you? Right, everyone? Right? I've been lied to. Everybody's been lied to. It hurts, doesn't it? Well, certainly does, especially if somebody you love, somebody you trust, and they lie to you, right? Well, I want you to know that God will never lie to you. In fact, God always tells you the truth. In fact, in Romans, it says, let God be true, and every man a what? A liar. And so you can trust what God says in God's word to be the truth. Now, you may not like the truth. You may not like the fact that you're a sinner and that God's going to hold you responsible for your sins. And that if you don't give your life to Christ, that you're going to spend eternity in hell. You may not like that truth, but it's still the truth. Why? Because it's from God. But God provided a way. So the gospel is what? It's the source. The source of the gospel is God. That means that the gospel comes from God. He devised a plan before the foundation of the world. 1 John 2, 2 puts it this way. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now you go, propitiation? That's a big word, Pastor Dan. I'm shocked that you were able to pronounce it. Well, I practiced all this week. Propitiation means to appease the wrath of someone. So, he is our propitiation. He, tore, he took the brunt of God's wrath for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So God is the source of the gospel. Number two, God is the subject of the gospel. God is the subject of the gospel. The gospel is all about God. He is both the source and its object. The gospel is about how we as sinners can be rightly related to the thrice holy God through the sacrifice of His Son. It's about how God can be both, as Romans 3, 26 says, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Or as John Piper puts it, God is the gospel. He is the assurance that that we receive when we believe the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. I love what Leon Morris said. If you don't know who Leon Morris is, he's an Australian uh, theologian, uh, quite brilliant. Uh, I don't know that there's not a book that he's ever written that wouldn't be appropriate uh, in somebody who really wants to know God's, uh, wants to know about God on the bookshelf. This is what he said. No topic is treated with anything like the frequency of God. Everything Paul touches in this letter, he relates to God. And our concerns to understand what the apostle is saying about righteousness, justification, and the likes, we ought not to overlook his tremendous concentration on God. There's nothing like it elsewhere. So what is the source? God. What's the subject? God. Again, Leon Moore said this, 
The thought of God dominates this epistle. The word God occurs, occurs 153 times in Romans, an average of once every 46 words. This is more than any other New Testament writing except 1 John and 1 Peter. And not only does God occur in Romans more frequently than any other writing, it occurs more often than any of them in that book. Apart from a few, from a few preposition pronouns and the likes, no word is used in Romans more, than, more frequently than God. Morris concludes, God is the most important word in this epistle. He also points out that Paul uses gospel 60 out of his 76 New Testament occurrence. So whenever Paul, in his 16 books, whenever he used the word gospel, he used it 76 times. 60 of it in Romans. Nine times in Romans, I'm sorry. The gospel is the ultimate good news that although we're sinners, God made a way through the sacrifice of his son to reconcile himself. And also, though it's costly for him, it's absolutely free for all who believe in Jesus Christ. So, who's the source of the gospel? Say it, church. Who's the subject of the gospel? Number three, the supply of the gospel. Can you imagine what it is? It's God. If I have a favorite verse... And, you know, you hear me say all the time, oh, I love this verse, one of my favorites. And you go, Pastor Daniel, not all of them are going to be your favorites. Well, I know. But First Timothy, I'm sorry, sorry, Titus, Titus 3, 1 through 7, has got to be my, one of my favorite verses, if not my favorite. If I was going to put something on my tombstone, it would be this. Look at verse 1. So Paul is writing to a young preacher boy named Titus. And this is what he's telling him to tell the church. He goes, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. That's what Christianity should be, shouldn't it? Remind them to be submissive. I don't have that on the board. I don't? Okay. I thought I did. Well, you never know. But remind them to be submissive to rulers. There it is. And authorities. To be obedient. Church, this is what we're supposed to be. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling. To be gentle. And to show perfect courtesy. Towards all people. Why? Why should we do that? Well, this is where really, this is where I love this verse. Verse 3. Are you still with me, church? Come on. For we ourselves. What were we before Christ? Now, I was 11 years old. Yeah, I've told you this a hundred times. I was 11 years old. I think the only, the worst thing I'd ever done was steal some king dongs out of a convenience store. I really did. I mean, to me, that's the greatest thing. That's, that's not what the Bible says we are before a holy God. How great were your sins? Here it is. For we ourselves were once foolish. We were disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passion and pleasures, passing our days in malice and in envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's what we were. You said, Pastor Daniel, you know, I wasn't that. Yes, you were. You were. Before, but in God's eyes, you were all those things. And if you read Ephesians chapter 2, you're worse. You're by nature children of wrath. That's how great your sin was. And he tells you all these horrible things. And then the most wonderful word of all Scripture comes up. But God. But God, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Why? 
not for righteous things that we have done, or not because of works of righteousness by us and by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is not getting something you do deserve. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly. I love that so much. Listen, I, I, love, I love ice cream. And if I had a big bowl of ice cream, I may give you some of it, but I ain't giving you a, a lot of it because I want it for myself. God didn't do that. God poured out his love. Isn't that wonderful? He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God has it. And he never runs out. And he pours on us richly. And he never gives up. That's the God we serve. Why would we not want to serve a God like that, right? And I love this verse in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, but he knew there was a boy named Daniel McCroskey who lived in West Memphis, Arkansas, that needed to be saved. And so Christ took all my sins. I'm 62 right now. So all my sins from July 15, 1960, until whenever God is pleased to take me home, all those sins put upon Christ on the cross, and he paid it all. He poured out on us richly. That's why we sing loud, because we're happy. Sometimes our circumstances in life aren't happy, but we're happy because we have the joy of the Lord, which is our what, church? Strength. Now, what is, let me go back. Let me see if you remember. What's the source of the gospel? I'm asking you a question. What's the source of the gospel? What's the subject of the gospel? What's the supply of the gospel? And who is the speaker for the gospel? Us. <laughs> Us. We're the speakers. We're the speakers of the good news. We're the ones who have experienced this great godly graciousness. I'm not even sure that's a real sentence. But we're the one who has experienced it. I love, I'm talking about all this food. I'm, are y'all getting hungry too? There was a really good hamburger place that Kathy and I went to a long time ago. It was downtown somewhere. Man, it was really, really good. Man, it had, I had bacon on mine. And they, they gave it to me correctly. They didn't put cheese on it. I don't know why anybody would want to ruin a hamburger by putting cheese on it. But some of y'all people are lost and you do that. But it was so good. Man, I just, ah, it was so, such a good burger. You know, the first thing I wanted to do after I ate that burger? Tell someone else. In fact, I think I told it to the church the very next Sunday. That's just a burger. See, the good news is that we want to tell everyone. I want you to experience what I have. I want you to experience what, what, the world that God would have for the world. The speaker of the gospel is the church. Romans 10, 14 through 15. Well, what's that other one, John? Put that up there. What's the one before that? Oh, yeah. I didn't put that in my notes. 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. The King James has a better word, I think. The King James says, therefore, knowing the fear Terror, T-E-R-R-O-R. The terror of the Lord, we persuade others. If someone in my family was lost, I want them to jump over me to get to hell. 
I don't want anybody to say that knows me, you never told me about Jesus. I want Sarver. I want Freeport. I want Natrona Heights. I want Catanning, Fort City, wherever you're all from. They should be able to... To, they, they need to be able to jump over Expressway Baptist Church, which is you, if they want to go to hell. We ought to, be, we ought to be the roadblock to that pathway. And how do we do that? By sharing, by living, by inviting. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone is preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How is your feet? Are they beautiful? Are you preaching the good news? Are you sharing Christ? Let me ask you this. Do you even know the good news? Have you ever given your life to Christ? If you were to die right now, right here at this time, where would you go? The two, the two answers are, I will go to heaven or I will go to hell. Well, tell me why you're going to go to heaven. Well, if your answer is anything other than, I realized I was a sinner. I realized because of my sins, I was separated from God. And because of that, I realized I need to give my life to Christ. I trust Christ's sacrifice on the cross and he died for me, and he rose again for me, and now I want to give my life to him. So I prayed, God, forgive me of my sins, come into my life, and I'll follow you forever. If you've done anything other than that, and that is anything other than your answer, then you're lost, and you need to give your life to Christ. A lot of people's answer is, why, why are you going to go to heaven? Well, because I'm a member of a church. Eh, wrong. Do you need to be a member of the church? Yes. But that church, being a church doesn't save you. If you say, well, if I would go, why, why are you going to heaven? You say, because, Pastor Daniel, I got baptized. Guess what? I'm going to teach you a Greek word. Eh, wrong. You didn't know eh, it was a Greek word, did you? <coughs> wrong. Baptism doesn't save you. The water means is, is symbolic of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and it's important, and you should be baptized, but it doesn't save you. There's going to be a lot of church members in hell. There's going to be a lot of baptized people in hell. You, you may say, well, Pastor Daniel, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm a good guy. I'm a good woman. I'm a good girl. You know, I've really, you know, I'm, I'm not the thug that you were. I've never stolen King Dongs out of a convenience store. I've been a pretty good person. And I believe that, you know, my goodness will outweigh my badness. What's that Greek word I just told you? Well, no, say it. Say it. Exactly. Eh, wrong. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whoever shall call upon God's name will be saved. Have you ever called upon God's name? Do you know the good news, and that the bad news, that you will be judged for your sins? The good news is Christ paid that debt if. You give your life to Christ if you become a Christian. How do you become a Christian? You say, God, I want to live for you. Forgive me of my sins, God. Forgive me. I want to live for you. Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, unless you hate your mother, your brother, your sister, yet your own life, you cannot be my disciple. You need to forsake all to follow him. Let me ask this church, is that true? Say amen. It's true. Because that's what the Bible says. The greatest, one of the greatest theologians who ever lived was asked this question. Can you give us some deep theological truth that you've learned through all your years of studying the Word of God? And this great theologian said this. Jesus loves me. This I know, 
for the Bible tells me so. Have you given your life to Christ? If you've never given your life to Christ, would you do so today? Or maybe you're a Christian and you're not a member of a church and you need to become a member. We would love you to have you at Expressway Baptist Church. This is a great church. Not because of its pastor, in spite of the pastor. The people are sweet. The people are wonderful. The people love Jesus. But the people are sinners. And we mess up and we're messy. But we love one another, don't we, church? Come join Expressway. Help us reach this world for Christ. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and every heart speaking to God. What is it that God has shown you in this sermon today? What is it? Are you, are you saved? Are you going to go to hell? Do you know? Well, you can know. John says in 1 John and in the Gospel of John, these things I've ever written that you may know you have eternal life. You can know. If you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, you can know. You can know. Give your life to Christ today. If you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, message us. Say, Pastor Daniel, this is so-and-so and so-and-so. Can you reach out to me? I'll do it this afternoon. As soon as I get home, I'll, I'll do it. I'll reach out to you. I'll Facebook message you. If you're here today and you don't know, if you were to die today, you don't know where you'd go. Make it, make it sure today. Give your life to Christ today. If you're in the invitation, come down front and say, Pastor Daniel, I don't care what time it is. I don't care if people are looking at me. I don't care. I need to get this settled. I need to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to follow Christ. Can you help me? I sure will. We'll, we'll wait. The church will wait. There's nothing more important than that today. Would you give your life to Christ today? Or maybe there's somebody here today that's, that's not a member. And you need to quit believing all the excuses and start believing God's word. Join. Join the church. Our sovereign God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all you've done. Lord, I pray that you'll work on the hearts of people. Lord, I bet you already, you already are. There's people who are convicted and they're struggling. God, have the Holy Spirit convict them so much that they, they can't wait another moment. That before Michelle or Bob plays a note, they're, they're down front asking you to, to forgive them. And they're, they're not, even before I finish this prayer, they're down front on their knees saying, God, save me. Saying, God, let me join this church. Saying, God, let me rededicate my life. Saying, God, I want you. I want to serve you. God, we pray that that will happen today. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go, page 285. If you need to uh, give your life to